All right, everyone. Good morning. Good Monday. Um, beginning of week seven. So let's talk about obsessive compulsive and related disorders. So just some general characteristics of this grouping of diagnoses. So um, obsessive compulsive disorder or disorders are characterized by the presence of both obsessions and compulsions. So obsessions are thoughts, essentially compulsions are behaviors. So speaking specifically about obsessions, these are thoughts that happen over and over again. Um, they happen involuntary, involuntarily. They're urges, they can be like experienced as images. Um, they are usually, uh, while the obsessions are going on, this it's considered, like I said, intrusive and unwanted. And in most individuals, the, the experience of obsessions is coupled with uh, anxiety, feelings of anxiety and distress. So what, hap what can happen is individuals attempt to stop or ignore, um, you know, push down, that's what it means by suppress. Uh, these thoughts, urges, and images, or they try to neutralize them with some other thought or action. So essentially compulsions are an attempt to dampen, suppress, push down, counter these obsessions that they are experiencing. So compulsions are repetitive behavior, some of the more maybe common uh, compulsions are hand washing, ordering, so putting things in a sequential order, um, putting things in a size order, and checking, you know, things like checking the stove to make sure it's off. So there be repetitive behaviors or mental acts, things like praying, counting, repeatedly saying words silently that the individual feels driven to perform in response to the obsessions. And then these rules that they have come up with that, that must be applied very rigidly. So if, for example, uh, the person needs to count by twos to a hundred, um, you know, in response to an obsession and they get to 194, um, and accidentally, they've accidentally skipped 192, they have to go all the way back um, until they get to 200 counting by twos perfectly. And sometimes it's about a, like a feeling that, oh, I, you know, I didn't say 192 with, with enough belief or enthusiasm. So again, whatever the rules are, they must be applied very rigidly, very perfectly. So the behaviors or mental acts are aimed at preventing or reducing anxiety or distress or preventing some dreaded event or situation. So this individual be potentially believes that, you know, the obs obsession is about their, you know, loved one passing away. So if they don't perfectly align some, you know, uh, figurines on a shelf, then they will be responsible for their loved one's inevitable death. Um, so these behaviors or mental acts are not connected in a realistic way with what they are designed to neutralize or prevent, or these compulsions are clearly excessive. And again, you know, we talk a lot about clinical judgment with this. So there isn't a part of that. Um, in terms of excessive, that is operationalized throughout this section as just taking a lot of time. Individuals can spend, you know, hours going through compulsions um, or experiencing obsessions. So this can be something where, you know, maybe they are not able to maintain employment, um, you know, their interpersonal relationships are suffering. 
So uh, some other obsessive compulsive and related disorders are characterized by preoccupations and by repetitive behaviors or mental acts in response to those preoccupations. So again, as, as we talk about this grouping, these are some things to keep in mind. So these disorders differ from developmentally normative preoccupations and rituals by excessive or persisting beyond developmentally appropriate periods. So these aren't necessarily things like like, uh, you know, athletes who have like a warm up ritual or something like that. These are different than that. Um, you know, you may have a pre test ritual where you line up your pencils in a certain way, or like for me, I have, if I have a big project or, you know, a paper or something big that I am about to work on, I generally like clean my space, uh, where, you know, I'm sweeping, I'm mopping, I'm throwing in laundry. Um, so these are, it's a way for me to not give myself any excuse to, um, you know, distract myself with cleaning during my project. So the distinct distinction between the presence of subclinical symptoms and a clinical distor disorder requires assessment of a number of factors, including the individual's level of distress and impairment in functioning. So as I mentioned earlier, you know, all of these, all of these interviews, all of this information gathering should be a conversation. So some certain symptom dimensions are common in OCD, including those of cleaning. So being obsessed with uh, having obsessions around contamination and cleaning compulsion. So again, it's the reasoning behind the cleaning is distressing. Um, symmetry, so symmetry, obsessions and repeating ordering and counting compulsion. Symmetry, again, it can be like the organization on a shelf. Um, I think I saw, sorry, that was a big yawn. Um, I, I don't know if anybody remembers the show, um, true life, but there was one on there about having obsessive compulsive disorder and, uh, one of the, uh, purse people who they were, you know, following kind of interviewing and stuff. She believed that if all of her, um, I think it was like figurines or objects or something like anything that had eyes needed to be facing to like the northeast or to the sun or something like that and if it wasn't um facing exactly that way then her mom was going to die and she was very convinced of that and she would take hours and hours out of her day to check to reorganize to you know make her figurines more perfect. All right. Forbidden or taboo thoughts. So these can be aggressive in nature, sexual in nature, religious obsessions and harm, fears of harm to oneself or others that are related to checking compulsion. So like I just talked about. All right. So specifically with obsessive compulsive disorder, like most commonly referred to as OCD, one of the, the, a couple of screening questions. So one, um, is, con is connected to obsessions. Do you ever have weird thoughts that you can't get out of your mind? And the other is, co uh, connected to compulsions. Are these rituals, are there rituals you can't resist doing over and over and over and over again? So many individuals with this disorder have dysfunctional beliefs uh, these beliefs can include an inflated sense of responsibility and a tendency to overestimate a threat. Some people experience perfectionism and intolerance of uncertainty and an overimportance of thought. So believing that having a forbidden thought is as bad as acting on it and the need to control these thoughts. So individuals with OCD vary in their degree of insight they have about the accuracy of the beliefs that underlie their symptoms. And these are on a like continuum basically, or a spectrum from absent insight, delusional beliefs, all the way to good or fair insight. Um, so a way to screen this could be asking, how sure are you that all of this makes sense and that the gain is worth the pain? 100%, 50%, 25%, not convinced at all, 
So another example, more specifically, would be, would, would you stop washing if you could? Um, so for example, if a person were to say, yes, these make complete sense to me, I'm completely convinced of it. No, I would not stop washing. That might give you um, the some insight into them not having any insight. And then like, how sure are you that all, the, all this makes sense? Like, I'm not convinced at all. Um, yes. Oh my gosh. Stop. I would love to stop washing if I could, that would be an indicator of more insight into, um, some of the dysfunction in their beliefs. Obsessions are not pleasurable or experienced as voluntary. They are intrusive and unwanted and cause marked distress or anxiety in most individuals. So very important to, um, remember that it's, you know, it's not for fun. It's not something that this person is like, you know, thriving, going through and doing the aim of compulsions is to reduce the distress triggered by obsessions or to prevent a feared event, such as becoming ill, you know, becoming, um, infested through, um, contamination compulsions are not done for pleasure. Although some individuals do experience some, relief from their distress or anxiety in doing that again. So this is one of the purposes of the compulsion is to, um, it's essentially in response to the obsession. Obsessions and compulsion must be time consuming more than an hour per day or cause clinically significant distress or impairment to warrant diagnosis of obsessive compulsive disorder. So um, one or the other of these, likely it will be both. It is common for individuals with obsessive compulsive disorder to avoid people, places, and things that trigger obsessions and compulsions. So you can look and you can ask some questions around avoidance. You know, what are some triggers? Are these uh, things that you try to avoid being around or engaging with? So within... The related disorders, we have hoarding disorder. A uh, screening question here is, do you find it impossible to ever throw anything out? So hoarding disorder is characterized by persistent difficulty, discarding or parting with possessions, regardless of their true value, um, or I guess I should say actual value, You know, regardless of the condition in which the possessions are in. Um, and the result, is a strong perceived need to save the items or to dist and, and experiencing dis any distress associated with even the thought of discarding these possessions. And so just being clear about the definition of persistence. So this indicates a long standing difficulty rather than a more transient life experience that may lead to excessive clutter, such as inheriting property, um, so just keeping in mind that, uh, and likely when somebody has hoarding disorder, it's been over the course of many, many years, likely decades, um, that an individual has been accumulating possessions. This differs from normal collecting, uh, because symptoms of hoarding disorder result in the accumulation of a large number of possessions. And this is important that congest and clutter active living spaces and an active living space is a place where people spend time like in a living room, in a dining room, in the kitchen, in bathrooms where they're going into the space and it needs to be functioning in a certain way to be utilized. Um, and then so these living areas are cluttered and congested to the point where their intended use is substantially compromised. Clutter is defined as a large group of usually unrelated or very marginally related objects piled together in a disorganized fashion in spaces designed for other purposes like tabletops, floors, hallways. And again, the emphasis here is on active spaces. So, you know, as we know, like attics can be used for storage, garages can be used for storage, basements. Um, these are places in which having um, clutter, having a collection of items would compromise the functionality of the space. So the excessive acquisition formed, um, the excessive acquisition form of hoarding disorder, which is characterized um, 
which characterizes most but not all individuals with hoarding disorder consists of excessive collecting, buying, or stealing items that are not needed for which there is no available space. Um, the stealing of items is rare. Typically, uh, the individual experiences distress if they are unable to or are prevented from acquiring items. Other features of an individual with hoarding disorder is ind are indecisiveness, perfectionism, avoidance, procrastination, difficulty planning and organizing tasks, and distractibility. So again, these are all questions to be asking your, like the person standing next in front of you, uh, figuring out if these are other features that the individual is experiencing. There is also a form of hoarding disorder called animal hoarding, and this is defined by the accumulation of a large number of animals and a failure to provide them minimal standards of nutrition, sanitation, and veterinary care, um, or to act on the deteriorating condition of the animals. So th they may have diseases that are not taken care of. They may starve. Um, they likely will die and the environment. So there's severe overcrowding, very unconditioned and sanitary conditions where, you know, they are, there's excrement in living areas, you know, they are the, their poop and pee are not being cleaned up, um, things like that. Individuals often retrospectively report stressful and traumatic life events preceding the onset of the disorder or causing its exacerbation. So again, a death, a loss, um, that was quite traumatic can be a trigger for, for excessive collecting, um, or, you know, collective or, uh, oh, like over too much collecting of items, um, or that it's something that maybe was under the surface. And then this traumatic event made, um, things worse where they were, um, obtaining more items. Um, you know, I've, I don't, for, for those of you who have seen, I think this show is called like buried alive or something like that. And it follows individuals with hoarding disorder, um, where they'll have, you know, an acre of property or more that has, you know, dozens of cars on it, dozens of trailers that are, you know, not usable. Um, so many times hoarding disorder expands outside of somebody's home. All right, so now we'll cover trichotillomania, which is also known as hair pulling disorder. And then the um, screening question here would be, do you pull out your hair? Trichotillomania is characterized by recurrent pulling of one's hair, resulting in hair loss and repeated attempts to decrease or stop pulling hair. So this person is just starting to stop trying to do it, trying to stop doing it. They're not able to do it. Um, the hair pulling is not trigger, triggered by obsessions or preoccupations. However, they may be preceded or accompanied by various emotional states such as anxiety or boredom. Uh, the hair pulling may also be preceded by an increasing sense of tension or may lead to gratification, pleasure, or a sense of relief when the hair is pulled out. So um, the hair pulling... Um, most like has, there are multiple regions of the body where hair pulling is most common and that's in the scalp, eyebrows and eyelids, and then some less, um, common places or some auxiliary places, meaning like they're additional to that are facial hair, pubic hair, or perirectal regions. And the term distress includes negative affects that may be experienced by the individual with hair pulling, such as a feeling of a loss of control, embarrassment, or shame. Um, so just so you have an idea of, you know, maybe how the individual reacts to their hair pulling. And the majority of individuals with trichotillomania also have one or more other body focused, repetitive behaviors, such as skin picking, nail biting, or lip chewing. Um, we so that we have trichotillomania and then we have excoriation, which is skin picking disorder. So, you know, everything is going to be incredibly similar to what was just covered with trichotillomania, but more specific to skin picking. So, uh, excoriation is 
characterized by recurrent picking of one's skin resulting in lesions. And they also have a, it repeated attempts to decrease or stop picking. So similar to trichotillomania, excretion, excretion is not triggered by obsessions or preoccupations. However, uh, the picking may be preceded or accompanied by various emotional states like anxiety or boredom. Um, they may also be preceded by an increasing sense of tension that may lead to gratification, pleasure, or a sense of relief when the skin or the scab is picked. So most commonly picked sites are on individuals' face, arms, and hands, but it's not limited to those areas. Skin picking can be accompanied by a range of behaviors or rituals involving skins or scab, skin or scabs. So um, individuals might search for a particular type of scab to pull. Um, they, and then they may examine, play with it, put it in their mouth, swallow the skin after it's been pulled. Um, so again, you can see kind of the ritualistic aspect of this. And then the majority of individuals with excoriation uh, spend at least an hour a day picking, actually picking at the skin or thinking about picking at the skin or resisting urges to pick. So we have body dysmorphic disorder. A screening question here, oops, is are you comfortable with your physical appearance? Uh, so body dysmorphic disorder is characterized by a preoccupation with one or more perceived defects or flaws in physical appearance that are not observable or appear only slight to others. So there's this disproportionate um, experiencing of whatever you know, part of their body that they feel is deformed. Um, so they are, uh, they also experience repetitive behaviors like mirror checking, excessive grooming. So, you know, maybe brushing hair for, you know, an hour a day, um, skin picking or seeking reassurance, ver verbal or otherwise reassurance. Um, this is also ex, uh, characterized by mental acts, like comparing one's appearance to that of other people. But ag again, you know, I'm sure that that sounds familiar to probably all of us. Um, it is to a completely different degree. And then, um, so mental acts in response to their appearance concerns. Their appearance concerns are not better explained by concerns about body fat um, so that's where you, um, you can do a differential diagnosis from a disordered eating or an eating disorder. Muscle dysphoria is a specific type of body dysmorphic disorder um, that's characterized by the belief that one's body is too small or is insufficiently muscular. This is almost exclusively experienced in males, but it's not you know, it's not impossible um, for a person who does not identify as a man to experience this. Um, the preoccupations with their body are intrusive, unwanted, time consuming. As you can see here on average, an individual is doing something in terms of checking, thinking, comparing um, for three to eight hours per day. And it's usually very difficult to resist or control these preoccupations. The individual feels driven to perform behaviors, again, checking, grooming, picking, seeking reassurance and, and other things, which are not pleasurable and may actually increase their anxiety or their dysphoria. Body dysmorphic disorder is, pro is by proxy a form of body dysmorphic disorder in individuals who are preoccupied with or I'm sorry, body dysmorphic disorder by proxy is a form of body dysmorphic disorder in which individuals are preoccupied with defects they perceive in other people's appearances. Um, so perhaps they are doing some repetitive behaviors um, or just being very preoccupied by the looks of another person. Um, Again, this could be that it is a defect or a flaw that is perceived differently by the individual than others. Um, so again, the proportions are different. Literally the way that the person perceives 
the body part is unlike how anyone else perceives it. Um, the individuals have ideas or delusions of reference, believing that other people take special notice of them or mock them because of the way that they look. So they believe that people are very aware of their, like the deformity or the disfigurement that the individual has um, and that others are talking about them. Uh, body dysmorphic disorder is associated with high levels of anxiety, social anxiety, social avoidance, depressed mood, neuroticism, and perfectionism, as well as low extroversion um, and low self-esteem. So again, these are all good questions to be asking the individual. Body dysmorphic disorder has been associated with high rates of childhood neglect and abuse. So again, something to potentially screen in the individual's family of origin and body dysmorphic disorder is also associated with high risk of suicide. So this is something incredibly important to screen for when you are working with an individual who you suspect um, may have body dysmorphic disorder.